Hi everybody, my name is Adam. Uh, I'm the founder of an organisation called As I Am, which is working to change attitudes towards people living with autism in Ireland and to empower people living with autism. Um, more importantly, I suppose I set this up because I have Asperger's syndrome myself. And the Middletown Centre for Autism have asked me to share some of my experiences around disclosure, around understanding or lack of understanding of disclosing the fact you have autism and around some of the challenges you face I suppose as you grow up and you become more independent and you're living with autism and understanding what that means. This is so important, I think it's an issue that doesn't get nearly enough attention and I'm so delighted that the Middletown Centre is doing this and I look forward to sharing my story with you in the next few minutes. So a question I get asked a lot and it's probably a good starting point is finding out when you had Asperger's Syndrome, when did that happen, um, how did it happen? Um, how should I do it? Should I tell my son? Should I tell my daughter? When should I do it? These are questions that I guess asked a huge amount. It actually is something that I think we don't always talk about, but a lot of families really, really worry about and stress about. So when I'm asked that question, I just have to be honest and say, there's no day that I remember being sat down and told, you have autism or you have Asperger's, because it was something that we just always very openly discussed. Um, I remember when I was really small, you know, I would as well as obviously a lot of the challenges that I had, there was good things. So I knew all the flags of the world. I knew all the heads of state. I knew I got an adult history book when I was like five. You know, I couldn't read it, but I'd look at the pictures and I learned all about Tutankhamun. So my parents, when things wouldn't go as well, so, you know, the fact that I had to go to a different school to my brother and sister for three years or the fact that, um, you know, we couldn't go place with this crowds of people or the plan could never change and I could have a meltdown. My parents would very frequently slip into conversation, you know, you know the way you're very good at this you know, all the flags of the world, but you know the way you're very, find this very hard, you can't go place with this crowds of people. And this is called Asperger's. So it's something that was just kind of always discussed and always talked about. I suppose there's a slightly different setup now these days because most children with autism, 86% in the Republic of Ireland, attend mainstream school, either in an, either in an autism class or in a mainstream class. So as a result of that, I suppose, it's a little bit different. Whereas for me, it was... It was very, I needed an explanation for why didn't I go to the same schools as my brother and sister um, because autism classes didn't really exist at that stage. Um, why was I being dragged around all these doctors from the time I was 18 months when first they thought I had cerebral palsy because of my coordination, then they thought I'd a, I had a brain tumour because I was so distressed and having meltdowns all the time, and then finally arriving at a diagnosis of autism. But I was aware of all of this going on around me. And I suppose for that reason, my parents felt there was a need to have an explanation. But also, they, I think they thought it was something that it was important that they affirmed. They saw it as a part of me. They understood the huge challenges because they were living with them every day. But they did also try and identify the more positive aspects and, and to talk about them. So in the same way I knew I was deaf, tangent, or I had hazel eyes, it was just something openly discussed at home. Um, what did that mean for me? I Because I want to talk about how I felt about that. And as a younger child, I think it was something that was quite positive. Uh, I kind of liked this this little identity that I had uh, whenever there was, you know, maybe a famous person who was talked about as having autism or there was, um, you know, a television character or anything about it in the news. My parents would try and talk about it and talk about it in a very positive light. So I quite liked this kind of membership of, I suppose, a secret society in a way. Um, but at the same time, I suppose, I maybe didn't fully grasp the impact that was having. So why it was that bit more difficult for me to mix with other people and... I suppose didn't really experience that frustration until later on and I think I see this in a lot of young people so come from a home where we talked about autism not only to me but to everybody so mom would tell any club I wanted to join he has autism these are things you need to consider we were open with our school when I made the transition to mainstream so something always openly discussed to a stage when I hit 11 or 12 and didn't want to hear the a word just saw it as this really negative thing and I'm going to talk about why I saw it as that but I just didn't want to get into it. So I see a lot of young people who come from families, maybe very involved in support groups around the country, very engaged in the autism community, probably from a very young age being brought to just about everything to do with autism. And kind of as they get that little bit older, they just don't want to have anything to do with it anymore. So I think that is, is, is something that definitely does happen. The next thing that I want to talk about is school. And did they really understand and support me in... I suppose, dealing with my diagnosis or understanding it. So I went to a special school for three years, um, first to a, an autism preschool and then from there directly to the feeder um, national school, uh, Ballyone Meadows. 
Um, and when I was around seven and a half, my parents, or maybe seven, my parents began to look at how can we mainstream because I'd really benefited my, from my time in special school. I do think now in this day and age where very much the policy is around mainstreaming and I very much support that, sometimes we can be very dismissive of, mainstream, of special education. People ask me which was better, I can't say because one enabled me to get to a stage where I could sit in a classroom and I could learn and it was very positive in that respect. Um, what I would say is that when we made the, when my parents made the decision to help me move to mainstream, and actually I should say we, because I remember my mom used to ask me, do you ever think you could go to a school like your brother and sister? And I used to say no initially, but then one day I said yes, so that really kind of lit a fire under mom and dad about, can we make this happen? Um, so they did, they very much helped me and the school we picked very much helped me in making that transition, but also in trying to be understanding of where I was coming from, not trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. Um, so one of the things that was done is a buddy system. So maybe six months before I made the move, they picked three or four children in the class to begin visiting me in special school. I began visiting the school once or twice, went on a school trip with them, kept in touch with these young people. The idea being that I kind of had allies in the classroom before I made the move. Um, I don't know if mature seven-year-olds are a thing, but they were kind of, I suppose, the people who were chosen were kind of leaders. They were people already popular, involved in the different kind of groups in the class. So I was going to have a bit of social acceptance before I came in. And that was hugely helpful because it was quite a transition to move from a classroom with six children and three adults to this. And we chose a school that was relatively small. I think it only had 18 people or something in the class. Still a very big move. Um, my class used to teach meth in special school, so I had my own workstation. I worked from left to right. Everything was very calm and controlled. To this very busy room where it was very hard to focus on what was going on, very hard to sit still, very hard to understand what the teacher wants us to do. These were all big challenges. So having that acceptance was important. Um, also what was important was uh, mom and dad chose a school that had a very inclusive culture. It was a school that was actually different to my brother and sister's school. They chose it because they thought that the principal really got it and the fact that it was that bit smaller, etc. And uh, one of the things I suppose that was hugely positive um, was that when I made the move before it happened, my parents allowed the class to have a talk about difference and about autism. Now, I don't think they got into kind of the triad of impairment or the, the, the science of autism, but I think they just touched on practically some of the things that I do that might be a little bit different, some are maybe my idiosyncrasies or whatever so that there was an understanding before I came as to why I might do certain things and that was very helpful I think and um, again it's something that other people would fear doing but I do think it meant that there was a little bit of understanding before I made the move and um, what I would say I suppose is that it isn't to say the things were without their difficulties and um, because it was still very difficult for me to interact with young people my own age when I was growing up in primary school and at first perhaps I didn't notice it so even for example if we were playing games in the yard big open space after a few minutes I'd often drift away and would run around doing my own thing and that gap I suppose became more pronounced as we got older so for example when you're younger maybe you don't realize as much the fact that you're different and um, maybe I suppose the gap isn't as pronounced because everyone relies a lot on their parents and everybody um, probably is a little bit less independent. Um, but from my perspective, I suppose, as we got older, people were going further and further afield. People were becoming more and more like teenagers. And I was caught in this stage where I wanted to be more independent on the one hand, uh, but on the other hand, really wanted everything to stay the same. And obviously part of the process of a teenager is breaking rules and breaking boundaries and pushing forward. But for me, that was the last thing I wanted to do. Um, so in that sense, that was probably my most challenging time in national school. But I would say that school was very good. The other thing that I would say is they tried to very much um, support me in learning the things that I wasn't good at through the things that I was good at. So for example, when I moved to national school, um, I was about 18 months behind everybody else academically because everyone else had been in a mainstream set, a setting from the time I was in a special school setting with obviously a very different curriculum. And also my parents had been clear when I was in special school, they wanted the emphasis to be on social skills and stuff. Um, so when I moved back, there was this huge gap in terms of reading, writing, maths. 
and we had to do as well as manage the transition we had to close that gap and um, myself and my SNA and the people supporting me um, but what but to be honest if, and even now if you put something in front of me that I'm not interested in it's very hard for me to engage with it or focus on it and it would have been even more so then um, but my school instead of just kind of constantly trying to ram these things down my throat they tried to engage me through things I was interested in so how did they improve my presentation skills and my reading and my writing they got me doing history projects and resource. So engaging me in things I was really interested in and then getting me to actually present them to the class after I completed them, which I think was also very good because it showed me in a very positive light to my peers. Um, I remember doing math sheets that used Roman numerals. They tried to engage me through the things that I was interested in and that was really important. The school I was in was also kind of known in the town for, for considering a small national school, lots and lots of clubs and activities, extracurricular stuff. And that was so helpful for me because my parents taught me how to socialize through activities and interests, um, which made such difference because I found it more hard than the unstructured thing. And I would only want to talk about history and stuff. It was very hard for me to talk to people my own age. So it was a lot easier um, to socialize through an activity, something I was doing. But at the same time, I was exposed to people my own age. So being able to do that in national school was very positive for me, I think, and did help my social skills. The other thing that I would say was very helpful was I had a really strong relationship with my SNA, um, which did a number of things for me. Um, because one, it was about having this person that I could really, who understood me better than I understood myself. So when I was becoming stressed, she knew when to when I needed a break. She knew when I needed a rest break. Um, she was my advocate in the classroom, so she'd be very good at explaining to teachers why I might do certain things, kind of fighting my corner when things weren't going as well. Um, she very much understood my sensory needs. So there was this really powerful bond that I think got me through the early stages of made, making that transition. But also, I think, actually got me to a stage where I was able to go to secondary school independently. I know there's that whole fear of, oh, if you have this one SNA for one, one period, perhaps you become over-dependent. But my SNA was so good at her job, she never let that to happen. So as I got older, she went from sitting next to me to being down the back of the class most of the time doing her own thing as I got older and only coming to me when I needed her. So the point where she was actually building me up, building me, building me up, while at the same time being this really important um, safety net. So I think that was vitally important. I think trusting relationships are so important in a school setting as well because it is a, a hard thing to come by sometimes when you have autism. Um, the next thing that I'd like to talk a little bit about was the whole area of telling my peers that I have autism and telling the community. So as I've already mentioned, come from a, a background where my family tell everyone that I have autism and are really open. And there was definitely benefits to that. So even, for example, when I was very small, it was very hard for a lot of clubs and stuff to take me because I'd just make for the door if I was hyper or if I was, if I was bored or if things got too much for me. So as a result, it was important that I had my parents would actually speak to clubs, explain my needs, get me into things, so there'd be an understanding if anything went wrong, which was so helpful. Um, also got a lot more acceptance, I think, from my peers because their parents knew and it was explained to their parents, so that was very positive. Um, and I remember when I was younger, even in national school classes, of publicly saying, you know, oh yeah, I've asked for just da, da, da. maybe when there's a discussion about it in the paper or if there was a particular character, I know when I was in national school, uh, Curious Into the Dog in the Nighttime came out, and I remember reading it in resource. Um, I'm still surprised now that I read it as an adult that mum let me read it. Um, but uh, I suppose uh, that was, you know, something that was very, again, very affirming, but also something we talked openly about. So I had no issue really telling it or explaining it to my peers as I got older. But then, as I said, when I got older and I got to puberty, I didn't want to talk about it. And I can't remember a moment... I think it was a series of moments really where I began to realise that I was treated very differently because I had Asperger's and probably as well as realising I was treated very differently, beginning to understand that I was very different and what that meant and why I found it harder to socialise and why I wasn't the same as other young people and really wanting to be. So I remember kind of overnight going from a point where I wanted to talk about it, where I didn't want to have any association to do with autism. And I see that now I see so often you know, as I am is obviously an organisation trying to change attitudes and fight some of the reasons why I didn't want to talk about autism, the kind of patronising and the, the misunderstanding and the stereotypes. But so often, even now I meet parents and they come into our events and say, you know, he's in the car, but he just won't come in because he doesn't want to be seen at an autism event. And 
I can so understand that because that's definitely what I went through when I was kind of finishing national school. And I think it was hugely difficult all of a sudden to talk about it. Also, you began to feel maybe that you were actually being stereotyped by other people when you talk. So sometimes it was other young people, but sometimes it was much older people as well. You would find that when they knew you had autism, they'd want to be supportive and they'd want to be nice, but they didn't know what the word actually meant. So suddenly you'd find people speaking a little bit slower or sometimes speaking a little bit louder. Um, and it was just really weird, to be honest. I was kind of like, I wish you could see yourself right now. But there, there was this feeling that, yes, you were being treated differently or you were you, you were less clever or less capable because you had autism. And that could be very, very frustrating. And I remember when I actually moved, not only did I not want to talk about it or not want to go to any extra support or anything to do with autism towards the latter half of my time in national school, as well as that I didn't want my parents telling anyone about it and would get very annoyed when they did. And when I went to secondary school, I didn't want to hear the idea of applying for resources, didn't want to hear the idea of having an SNA near me, didn't want to hear the idea of having anything to do with it because I thought this the, school, the national school I was in was one where most of the children would be going to different secondary schools. So there was an opportunity for me if I like to make a clear break and be independent and not be associated with this anymore. And that was very much what I was determined to do. Um, so I do feel that it got a lot more difficult to tell my peers. And there's kind of a catch-22. Why did it get more difficult? Because less people understood. Because I felt people didn't understand. People responded weirdly. And why does that happen? Because not enough people tell their story and not enough people disclose. So it's kind of a constant cycle that until we actually do tell our stories more and get more information out about what it means to have autism, seeing the person first, um, understanding what the actual needs are instead of misconceived needs, this problem is going to get worse and worse and worse, but it does require leadership and it does require people to say, we still need to tell our story and realise that there is long-term benefits if there is some short-term challenges at times. I also think that it highlights that disclosure should never be done in a vacuum. When we do disclosure in a vacuum, what we do is we just say something and no, no one's any the wiser what it actually means. So it's important that when someone wants to disclose, and I do this so often through our secondary school programme, ensuring that before they disclose or around the time they disclose, People are given the information about what that actually means, how they can help, what they should and shouldn't do. Because sometimes it is just awkwardness on everyone's part, and it can be so much easier um, if there's that understanding. I just realised there that I didn't really get to the stage later in my life when I began to disclose again. So after going through a very difficult period in secondary school where I had tried to be independent for two or three years, didn't want anything to do with autism, and then got to a point where the junior set was a big struggle, anxiety came in, organisational skills were a big issue. Uh, and I suppose also getting a lot of support and tr uh, trying to understand myself better and understand that actually part of maturing was acceptance. And uh, I got great help from a resource teacher in my school in that regard. But I remember that, um, I remember that one of the things that could be difficult at times was that you still didn't want to tell your peers about it. So whatever about accepting, you maybe had to take some support or whatever about accepting that you had to do certain things. It wasn't something that you wanted to discuss with your peers because it was kind of, again, like, well, you know, I'm beginning to socialise and everything is going really well. So why would I throw this among the pigeons? Also because as well as being an autistic person, I'm an Irish person and we're not good at talking about things. So it's kind of like you don't want to be singled out or treated any differently. So you just kind of ignore it and take it on the chin. I think when you're in secondary school now, I sometimes talk about it like being a secret society. I knew loads of lads in my secondary school who had diagnosis of autism, who I would have known from when I was young on support groups and stuff. Because a lot of us don't have or need support when we're in secondary school, what can happen is people don't really notice. They think maybe sometimes they say, he's a bit strange, he's a bit odd. Maybe sometimes people say, okay, so the only thing he does is he doesn't do Irish or he types his exams. But so do so many people who are from different countries or so many people who um, who have dyslexia. So because of the prevalence of lots of different types of diversity in our schools now, we can't assume that people know why people are getting certain help. So it does actually require an explicit conversation sometimes. But I remember after going to transition year, which was a really positive turning point for me because... It was really when I began to socialise because there was these opportunities to socialise in a very structured way. Um, there was 
and get more comfortable with a group of people and then something began to happen organically and I do think socialising has to happen organically you can create an environment but you can't make it happen um, the other thing was that um, I suppose around that time I began to feel wow I'm in a good place now I'm socialising I'm really happy um, last year was dreadful but I can relax now that something needed to be done so that's when I started blogging and I started trying to set up an organisation and started listening to other young people's stories and I suppose what was funny was I'd be happy at that stage to go to a hotel and speak to 200 people. But sitting next to my best friend, would I bring it up in conversation? No. So how most of my friends in secondary school found out that I had autism, bar one or two who would have known, uh, just legacy, was media interviews. So I started when As I Am took off, I was did a lot of media, including the Late Late Show. Half of my friends found out the night I was on the Late Late Show. They just thought I was kind of a do-gooder, doing all this work on autism, and I led them to believe that. Uh, but then I told. And what was very interesting was we were able to have amazing conversations after I disclosed about some of the things that I used to do when I was a younger teenager, I learned to socialise that were very unusual. An example of that would be, um, say, I liked rules. Teenagers, not so much. My parents told me, only ever cross the road if there's traffic at the traffic lights. I'm sure other people's parents tell them that as well. Uh, everyone else ignored that. Any road we were at, I would walk, like, sometimes quite a distance to a set of traffic lights to use it, because that was the rule, and I liked rules. Um, as well as that, in terms of, even now, if I'm out with my friends and we've been in a busy bar, or I've been sitting for a long period of time, I take off on my tippy toes and I'm stimming. So people didn't know what that was, but they just accepted it for me but I don't realise not everyone has such uh, accepting friends but I was able to have really good conversations with them after the disclosure and I think as well as them understanding me a little bit more there was also maybe a piece of them understanding other people a little bit more because one of the things that I'm frustrated by still is that we can give people the theory but there's a whole job of work to, to be done in helping people apply the theory to social situations so yes I went to that autism event and yes I got a better understanding what it's like to live with autism. Okay, it's two weeks later and I'm at a party. And there's a guy and he keeps saying awkward things. There's a person and he has his hands over his ears all the time because he can't bear the music. It's getting people to say, oh, hold on. Not, oh yeah, that was grand, but this is different. It's actually getting them to apply the knowledge and that's important. But certainly something that I think I've been able to help my friends with a little bit and I think it's something that I would like more people to be doing because we have to apply the knowledge. That's the only way I think that we'll we'll get to a stage of inclusion. I'm crossing over myself a little bit with some of these questions because I know the next one is, um, did I feel I was ever treated differently? So I think I've touched on sometimes I thought peers could even act a bit strange if they knew about the diagnosis. And it comes from a very good place. People want to be inclusive, but they maybe don't know how to do it. Kind of talked about that. The bigger way I felt I was treated differently, and I think where a lot of the stigma and the dislike of autism came from when I was a younger teen, was actually how much older members of my community behaved, and in a very well-intentioned way. But again, because people have never been given the knowledge, we've mainstream people, not knowledge, I would find bizarre situations where people would treat me so differently as I, as I grew older in terms of trying to be really nice, but being really patronising and actually holding me back. Um, I remember one time being asked by somebody, what stage you had in school now, third year? Oh, right, you'll do the junior set. You wouldn't do the junior set, though, sure you wouldn't. And I'm kind of looking and saying, God, I wish I wouldn't, but actually I am. Um, you know, so there's this misconception, I think, sometimes that people just have a general idea of special needs, no idea what it means. And so how they actually try and help you and support you can be really disempowered. And I think it raises a huge question about how do we provide support to people as they reach kind of that preteen, teen, and into college stage because what we do at the minute is we provide supports in the least discreet way possible um, and you know if you're going to discuss something very personal um, or if you wanted support with something maybe that there's nothing to be ashamed of about it but that you're just kind of self-conscious of let's let's take mental health as a prime example I think you'd want that done in a very discreet sensitive appropriate manner sometimes that support that we provide to people with autism we don't ask how would you like to provide it we don't like ask is it something you're comfortable with? Rather, it's something we just provide in this really fixed shape in front of everybody. So, in other words, maybe as you get older, I see so often when I'm in secondary schools, there's a teenager, you know, you'll see a teenager with autism walking down the corridor 
and they're nearly having a wrestling match with their SNA because they don't want this person walking next to them all of the time because they fe- already feel different. They feel this highlights them further. You go into schools and there's this big stark door that says resource on it and it's right in the middle of the of the the building and people are conscious about going into the room. Uh, I remember distinctly I'd be so frustrated in sixth class I had to get assessments and stuff done for going to secondary school and sometimes even we'd be doing nice things in class it wouldn't you know necessarily be class it, I remember at occasion there was activities and stuff and I kept being pulled out of these activities to go to this assessment stuff and of course it was needed or whatever but it's that thing that when you're at that stage and you're beginning to feel uncomfortable you're beginning to feel different and you have to walk to the end of the classroom and go with someone or you have to leave the classroom and go to something else find a bizarre at secondary school we provide a lot of the support sphe csp religion these classes that aren't seen as important but actually i think sphe is massively important for a lot of people with autism but as well as that it's just that bit where there's a lot of team building and more activity based classes and we take people with autism out of them now i don't have all the answers about how we fix that but i just think supports need to be a lot more bespoke and the quest, the thing that never happens at the moment is we never say to teenagers, what are you comfortable with? We just start providing support, sometimes support that isn't even needed in a very over-empowering, overpowering way. And I think that's, it, it, it's, it's unfortunate because what I see, even talking to people who are in college now, is because of how the support is provided, people stop taking it even though they might need it. I have experienced that when I was younger, but people do it much older, so even... I didn't like how supports were provided in schools. So now in college, where I'm really going to need supports in transition, I'm not going to take them. And I think that's a problem. So we really need to get to the bottom of that. And I think there is a reality that when people with autism don't want to take support, for whatever reason, personal to them, we need to get creative. But how can we provide those supports in different ways? Just to give you a very basic example, not having an SNA in secondary school. Probably didn't need a full-time SNA in secondary school either. Um, but what was important for me was to have that safety blanket that I spoke about earlier. So someone I could go to who knew me really well, who could withdraw me from certain situations that we had a very close relationship with. So I was able to substitute the role of an SNA as I got older with a couple of incredibly strong relationships with teachers. And again, I'm coming back to that whole issue of trust and trusting relationships and having that network of people around people with autism. So I think that when a person won't take support directly, we need to look at well, how can we provide support differently. And I think that's that's massively important. And I think the final thing, just in terms of building capacity, that I wanted to touch on a little bit is uh, one of the big problems in how we provide support and how we support someone at the present is it's actually completely disempowering. So, for example, when I was in secondary school, I was really lucky to have this incredibly supportive secondary school. Um, when I had faced challenges both years of the state's exams, they stopped, they looked, how can we do this differently? Let's build a game plan for you. I was, for example, at one stage, given my own room to study and in and towards like the very, very end of sixth year. Because so, supervised study, too difficult to sit still. Home, hard for anybody. So this space where I could move around, I could study in a different way, using podcasts, really, really supportive, got me my own exam centre because uh, the anxiety and stuff being in a room with other people. Couldn't have done enough to help me. Um, but the problem for me, even now, is often when I need help, I don't ask for it until it's way too late because I get really anxious about even asking it for it and how it would be responded to. I was lucky that when I was in the school system, um, my mom could pick up the phone and say, this is a problem, and get it sorted out. The problem is then overnight we go from this highly supportive environment where there's a very clear structure to work within to going to college or going to the next stage in life, work, PLC, adult services, and all of a sudden you're expected to advocate for yourself all of, and I understand and support the idea that adults would be able to do that but if we're going to do that why aren't we actually teaching people at a much younger age how to get support themselves why aren't we making it much easier for young people to actually ask for support why aren't we making some that's providing numerous means for how people access support even if they don't want to say it directly make it very clear that you want such requests why are we not giving people the skills to advocate for themselves to, in terms of when I'm dealing with government departments around disability, when I go to college and I'm facing these different challenges. We need to think about when people are still in school, giving them those skills, if, we're go- if we actually want them to do it when they're adults. Because at the minute what's happening is the moment someone becomes 18, they are expected to advocate for themselves. Their parents are locked out. But it's so wrong because we haven't given people those skills. 
uh, I know my very brief visit to college, um, that was a very big challenge because where do I actually go to get help? It's such a bureaucracy. No one even knows me by name here anymore. So I actually need to have these skills and we don't give people those skills at the moment. And I think that's very bad. So we completely protect people from the world for ages. Then we expect them to grow up over the night. And I think it's it's something that's very worrying. And I think we need to do more to actually build people's capacity to do things for themselves. Because at the moment, we only talk about resources, but we don't actually talk about resourcing the person.